This afternoon, you are here, and I'm going to start now. This afternoon, you are here to learn how you can... I should, have, should, I should have waited for you. I knew you'd be here. You're here to learn how you can stand out from the competition, from your peers, from the crowd, and from the pack. And the challenge a lot of lawyers have is a lot of people see them as a bit like playing cards. Playing cards, we're familiar with playing cards. They're all different, but actually, you only know which playing card is which once you have reason to start focusing on them. And for most lawyers, people see them as playing cards, but from the back. They don't know what makes you different. They don't, what, they don't know what makes you stand out one from another. So this afternoon, you are going to learn what it is that you can do in order that people will recognize you as being different and distinct from the lawyers with whom you are competing. You can only do that if you stand out in some way. And the challenge for a lot of lawyers is you don't want to spend a fortune on clever marketing and branding. Or maybe you're in a practice that has spent a lot of money on marketing and branding, but you don't feel that you're able to speak confidently about why that firm is different from any other firm you've worked for. So I'm going to give you a simple and easy framework that you can apply in order to stand out from the crowd. So I think that should be a good use and value of the next half hour or so. And the framework I'm going to use is a seven-point framework of, uh, that will help you achieve standout success for your practice and your career. You'll notice there are seven points here. They run the letters A to G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I'm going to run through each of these and the particular strategies that you can adopt in order to stand out from your peers and from the crowd. A stands for appearance and attitude both face-to-face -face and online. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, if you're the sort of lawyer who walks in a room confidently, positively, enthusiastically, and people are drawn to you, as I know happens with Penny and her husband Mike, for example, who now get a name check on my video, uh, fantastic divorce lawyers, Penny Rabi and co., and then you have a particular impression on the people who meet you. On the other hand, if you're the sort of lawyer who shuffles into the room and doesn't make eye contact with people, you're probably going to need to focus on one of the other strategies because as you can notice, if I'm not looking at you, you're probably less engaged in what I'm saying. Your appearance has a key impact on the extent to which people will remember you and be impressed or otherwise with your enthusiasm or lack of it. Your attitude affects that as well. If you're a very brash, out there lawyer, giving your opinion on anything and everything, some people would be attracted to that. Some people would prefer that you took a little time to listen more to their specific situations and challenges before you start leaping in, giving them advice. Do you have the, an attitude which engages the people that you meet? And if you don't, are there steps you can take in order to have a more engaging attitude that will help you to stand out from the other lawyers that you're competing with? Now, my background is an accountant. You could tell that, couldn't you? Or maybe not, because I'm not your archetypal accountant. I never was. Long before I developed a, a passion for accountancy or even dreamt of becoming an accountant, I had an unusual hobby. I was about 12 years old when I developed an interest in magic. And I started entertaining people with magic. I'm, you're not going to learn anything about magic today. There might be a, a trick at the end relevant to what we're talking about. But because I started entertaining people with magic at a young age, I developed an ability and an interest and a passion for standing up and communicating, hopefully in an effective way, which helped my accountancy career for as long as I had it in a way that most accountants don't get to benefit. Most lawyers don't get that opportunity either. 
But if you're not confident standing up and speaking in front of people, then either don't try and do it or develop the skills so that you will do it. The best organization for developing the skills to have the confidence to stand up and speak in public is something surprisingly called Toastmasters International. Now in Britain we think of Toastmasters being red, jacket, red jacketed masters of ceremony at functions and events. But Toastmasters International is an international um, speaking association that helps people develop the skills and confidence to stand up and speak to audiences. It's a fantastic organization. If you're going to become a professional speaker, which I've done, then you join the Professional Speaking Association, which is about helping professional speakers speak more and speak better. Very different. But it all comes down to appearance and attitude. There are some people around out there who will talk to you about personal branding. And again, they can help you with this type of thing. It's not what I do. I prefer doing the whole thing at uh, conferences and events in-house days for larger firms as well. But I love speaking at events like this and working with individuals who are determined to be more successful. Appearance and attitude. Should we move on to B? Oh, I could have shown you. I could have shown you some archetypal lawyers. Uh, who have different, different attitudes and appearances. Um, you can see each one would give a different impression to those people who they meet. I said I'd also mention how you appear online. If you don't know how you appear online, Google yourself. They can't touch you for it. If you've got a unique name, just type your name into Google. See what comes up. See how many old profiles from old forums and things you might have done in the past pop up. If you have a very common name, as I have, Mark Lee, there's over a thousand Mark Lees on LinkedIn. There's 15 of us with Wikipedia pages. It's a very common name. If I want to Google myself, I have to add a word like accountant, or you might add the word solicitor, I might add the word speaker, I might add the word magician. You have to add something and put your name in quotes to find out the real you as, regard, as compared with other people with your name. But it can be quite instructive to find out what happens. I know, for example, there's a CPA in America called Mark Lee. There are two finance directors in the UK called Mark Lee. Do I get confused with them? Possibly. But actually, it's so easy to find me online, I doubt it happens very often. What you do want to do, however, is ensure that when people look you up online, they find you consistently across the web, and they don't find different versions of you on the web. They don't find the you from five years ago. They don't find the CV or the profile you put on LinkedIn five years ago that doesn't reference who you are and what you do and what you specialize in now. You want to ensure that, there's, ensure that there is consistency. Consistency as regards how you describe yourself when people meet you, how other people describe you, how you're referenced in your LinkedIn profile, how you're referenced in your Twitter profile, although that can be a bit more personal. There's little point in having a, a Twitter profile for your firm. People don't tend to look up and read Twitter, Twitter feeds from firms as much as they do from individuals. So be yourself. But how you look and how you behave will always impact whether you stand out positively. You want to be the best you can online as well as in person. Does that make sense? Now I'll move on to B. B stands for business, business messaging, business branding. It's a whole subject in its right. There's a load of marketing experts and gurus who will tell you how to market your firm effectively. My tip here is to ensure that you describe yourself in ways that identify the benefits you bring to people who have challenges and problems that you solve, because that's what they care about. The idea of having a USP, a unique selling proposition that identifies you as being unique from any other lawyer on the planet, isn't going to happen. 
Because with respect, you're not unique. Well, that's not true. I apologize. You are each unique, but the service you provide, the service that people perceive they're getting from you, is unlikely to be unique, i.e., unlike any other in the world. What makes it different and unique is you as an individual. Until people get to know you, your business message has to engage them as being distinct, but don't expect it to be unique. That's setting too high a bar for your business message. I've got some examples here of ways in which lawyers distinguish themselves from each other. An increasing number of lawyers, be it personal injury or conveyancing, offer no win, no fee. I wouldn't imagine for one moment that divorce lawyers like Penny Raby and Co. would offer no win, no fee. That's uh, really not practical. But, and I didn't know you were going to be here when I put up this example, do you describe your business and does your business appear online as, for example, BML solicitors or is it a bit more focused? BML divorce lawyers. Because it will stand out more from all the other BML solicitors or BML lawyers or whatever your name is or the name of your practice. Make it easier for people to find your practice and the areas of law that you specialize in. Clever strap lines may be helpful, may. Strategic alliances with other organizations, collaborators, people who provide services to the same client base as you but don't provide legal services. Um, a neat graphical idea. Yeah. You tell me what the bundle of rubber bands means, I don't know. Or describing yourself in uh, rather highfalutin ways, the most experienced firm specializing in this area in the UK. Can't be proven one way or another, but as lawyers I'd expect you to know what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. But there are different ways in which you can distinguish yourself. Just calling, just calling yourself a firm of uh, solicitors is not... Where's that pointing? Can't see. Just calling yourself a firm of solicitors is unlikely to help you stand out from all the other law firms out there. Do come and join us. There's no extra charge. So you will stand out more if your business message gets on the radar. Radar is a great acronym I identified to help you test your business message when you're speaking to people. Is your business message relevant to the people that you're talking to? Is it authentic? Is it true? Is it distinct from other lawyers that they meet? Not unique, is it distinct? Is it accurate? And most of all, is it repeatable? If you go across from Legal X, if you go across into the Account X exhibition, talk to a lawyer, have a chat, uh, talk to an accountant, I'm sorry, and they tell you what they do, you tell them what, they, what you do, is what you say sufficiently distinct that they will be able to repeat it and say, I met a great divorce lawyer who's known as the uh, divorce Rottweiler because she secures such good outcomes for her divorce clients. Now, that, that would hook me. And somebody here has that strap line. It's unique, it's relevant, it's authentic, it's distinct, it's accurate, it is repeatable. So that's a good challenge for coming up with your, your business message. We move on to C, conversational impact. How can you ensure that the conversations you have with people have more impact and help you to stand out from the other lawyers that they meet and know? Well, I offer you here uh, a very important observation. How many people in the room feel that they are more introverted than extroverted? Show of hands. Most lawyers will often say they're introverted. Thank you for your honesty. The rest of you, thank you for your confidence. Oh, let me just check. How many people in the room don't like putting their hands up? That's the rest of you. Okay. The great news is introverts tend to be better conversationalists than extroverts. Sounds counterintuitive. A good conversationist, you think about the people you know who you enjoy talking with. There's the clue. They're great listeners. People love talking about themselves. So if you're a little more introverted, you're likely to be listening more, 
So the key is to be able to ask good questions to encourage people to talk more about themselves in a relevant way. And then people will like you more because you're listening to them, you're interested. I'm going to offer you the four suits approach to having more powerful conversations. Four suits from a deck of cards. We start with spades. The beginning of a conversation when you meet somebody, you want to dig around with your metaphorical spade asking into that. I'm attempting to dig here, but with one hand because I've got to hold the mic. You're asking intelligent questions to find out more about them. What you're particularly keen to do in the first instance is to try and ask questions which will enable you to form an emotional bond. Something you feel strongly about, heart and soul. Something that you have in common with the other person. Because if you find something you have in common, be it a passion for a similar sport, sporting interest, you've got family at similar levels, you live in the same part of town, you grew up in the same area, you went to the same college, you worked for the same firm, something you feel passionately about, you'll f more easily form an emotional connection and an emotional bond. And what does that do? That enables people to feel that they like you faster than if you don't do it. And I'm sure you've heard that old expression, people do business and people refer people to those whom they know, like, and trust. So you've met them, they know you, get them to like you by asking the right questions so you can form an emotional connection. Then when you've done that, you can move on to the third part of the four suits process, and that's clubs. Because you're looking to find in your memory, clients who are in the same club as the person that you're with or with their clients. So, for example, if you're talking to accountants, you want to have been asking them questions that will get them to tell you about clients of theirs who are in the same club, in the same situation as clients of yours or clients that you've dealt with. So, you need to identify those client stories beforehand so you're in a good place to talk about them briefly when you meet new people. Because if you talk about clients of yours in the same situation, clients, situations that you've resolved, clients who feel a lot happier, more confident as a result of the advice that you've given them, the people that you're with will remember you more because what you were talking about was relevant to them, to people, either to them or to people they care about. Yeah? So I've talked about spades, I've talked about hearts, I've talked about clubs. The fourth suit is diamonds. Diamonds, we know, are valuable. And the most valuable part of a conversation that you have, if you're looking to win more work, if you're looking to get more referrals and recommendations, the most valuable part of the conversation is the follow-up. What are you going to do afterwards? So again, it's worth thinking beforehand, what can you promise to do by way of a follow-up from a conversation that the person you're with will find valuable? Promising to send your marketing brochure doesn't count. Promising to send a help sheet, some tip sheets, some legal traps that all people trying to sell their own property fall into. Five tips to avoid employment disputes. Particularly if you can make it relevant to different audiences. For, so, for example, if you were to go to my website, bookmarklead.co.uk, you've all got a, a bookmark, I hope, you will find on my website, and if you can't find it, email me and I'll send them to you, I've prepared LinkedIn tips for people who want to improve their LinkedIn profile. And I've got one for accountants, one for lawyers, one for tax advisors, one for CPAs, one for NEDs, one for uh, executives, and so on. I've tailored them for different audiences. It's pretty much the same content, but it, I have tailored it for different audiences. And it's freely available to anybody who wants it. Drop me an email if you can't find it on the site. Now, that doesn't benefit me. It benefits my audiences, the people that I'm with. And I, I, I will mention it if it comes up in conversation with people, 
because it's something I can provide them that's useful and valuable and distinct and timely often as well. In fact, you'll notice on my, my, my bookmark is actually my business card. And on the flip side of it, there's space for action. Now, I put that there so the people I give it to can make a note of anything that they've promised to do for me or that they promised to do for themselves to remind them of what they want to do. So you might add you know, LinkedIn tips or something on there if you, want to if you want me to send you my LinkedIn tips. Whenever I take somebody's business card, I always make a note on it of what I'm promising to do by way of follow-up so that I don't forget, so that I can keep my promise. I said earlier, people tend to do business with people they know, like, and trust. How can you get people to trust you quickly? Spin that around. We know we don't trust people if they break their promises to us. So if you make a promise and then keep the promise, you are on the way to helping people to feel that they can trust you. So part of your follow-up is promising to do something and then keeping that promise. It doesn't have to be sending them something. It could be as simple as connecting with them through LinkedIn. It could be posting an endorsement or a recommendation on their LinkedIn profile if you found their service of value to you. It could be sending them a connection, linking them with somebody else who they need to meet or would benefit from meeting. There's a host of things you can offer to do by way of follow-up if you think about it in advance and you've got it clear in your head. Don't just think of follow-up as, is it worth me putting this person on my newsletter list and sending them regular emails? That doesn't really count. It gets you off the hook. You've done something. But it's not of value to them unless you really, really, really get so much feedback from the people you send your newsletters to that you can say with honesty, people love getting my newsletter. Does that make sense? So that's the four shoots approach to having more powerful conversations. Spades, digging around with your metaphorical spade, making sure you ask the right sort of questions. Hearts, you're looking to form an emotional connection. Clubs, identify clients of yours you can talk about who are in a similar position to the people that you're with or to clients of theirs that they care about. And diamonds, what are you going to do by way of a valuable follow-up? And the four suits approach makes those conversations more powerful and memorable so that you can stand out positively. So we've done A, we've done B, C. D stands for dependability and trust. I've stressed the fact that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. So you need to evidence to people that you are dependable and trustworthy in a way that most other lawyers don't do early enough in the conversation or early enough in the relationship. How can you do that? Well, one way is to make promises that you then keep, as I've already stressed. And it's probably the most effective way of doing it. Think about what offers you can make, what you can say that you will do, in order that you can then keep that promise. It might be, for example, not only do you follow up once, but you follow up more than once. I recommend a process of 24 7 30. Follow up once within 24 hours, follow up again within seven days, follow up again within 30 days. Doing different things each time. Might be an email, might be a phone call, might be something through LinkedIn, it might be commenting on their blog, uh, connecting with them on Twitter if you're into that sort of thing. There are a host of ways in which you can do this. Most lawyers don't spend time looking to build up trust until somebody becomes a client. Great, stand out from them, from all the rest. Start looking to build up the fact that you are dependable and trustworthy earlier in the relationship. Because what you want to do is to influence what people say about you when you're not there. If people say positive things about you, it's because they trust you. 
If they're saying negative things about you, it's because they don't trust you. I am not a great believer in the fact that all publicity is good publicity. If people are saying negative things about you, they're damaging your credibility, you've got to make sure that you keep the promises that you make. And that way, if people are talking about you, the people that you've met who are not prospective clients, but they know people who are prospective clients, or they may know people who are prospective clients. So you might meet somebody, you might be a conveyancing lawyer. You talk to them, you find out they've lived in their house for 10 years, they've got no intention of moving. Your instinct might tell you, well, it's a waste of time talking to this person, unless your experience tells you, hang on, their kids are probably old enough to be buying their own properties. Their brother, father, mother, sister, other members of their family, friends might be looking to buy properties. Has anybody that they know bought or sold a property recently and had a particular issue with it? Did they get a good service from the lawyer? What did they like? What didn't they like? Then talking about your clients who found your service particularly valuable and the confidence that they had or how issues or challenges were resolved. You've been helpful, you've been constructive. Maybe you've introduced them to somebody who can help them. People are saying positive things about you when you're not there because you're dependable and trustworthy. And the other lawyers they've met were, met were only interested in talking about themselves and then were no longer interested because that person wasn't a prospective client. It's one of the challenges when we go networking. Anybody in the room love going to networking events? Well done, sir. Well done, both of you. I noticed you were, you noticed you were in a minority. I noticed that nobody at the front turned around to see whether anybody else put their hands up. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I do talks like this for lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, bankers, all sorts of professional people. Every audience I do this talk for, when I ask that question, who loves networking, people put, only a few people put their hands up. Every other type of audience, everybody at the front looks around to see what other people do. Except when I'm talking to lawyers. Lawyers couldn't care what anybody else thinks. It's only what I care about. Them. It's only what I do that matters. There's nothing wrong with that. But I have noticed that lawyers are distinct and special in that regard. And why not? Because I'm telling you anyway, hardly anybody put their hands up today. Um, but why do I mention that? One of the reasons we don't like networking, a lot of people don't like networking, is there aren't enough prospective clients in the room. If you go networking expecting to meet prospective clients, no wonder you're disappointed. No wonder you don't like it. No wonder you don't think it's a value. The only reason to go networking is to meet people with whom you might subsequently be able to develop a business relationship. And that business relationship might mean that they become a client. It might mean they introduce you or refer you to somebody who's a client. That's very unlikely to happen at the networking event itself. Very few people attend a networking event and think, oh, I hope I'm going to meet a lawyer here to solve my legal problems. It's just not realistic, is it? So prove yourself dependable and trustworthy so that your reputation ensures that you stand out positively. So we've done A, appearance and attitude. B, business messaging and branding. C, conversational impact. D, dependability and trust. We now move on to E, your expertise and experience. And depending upon where you are in your career, we might also be talking about your education and your endorsements. Endorsements are, are a link, feature of LinkedIn. Uh, can I just check how many people in the room have a profile on LinkedIn? Most people. I would encourage you to have a profile on LinkedIn. It is a source of people finding you, even if, they're not, even if all they're doing is looking to find you or to check up on you. It's worth being there and having an up-to-date profile. LinkedIn plays a little game, you may have noticed. It encourages people to endorse you for your skills. My background, I spent 25 years after I qualified as a chartered accountant, I was a tax specialist. I did quite well in the field of tax. So when I first had a LinkedIn profile, a lot of people endorsed me for tax. And I was quite proud of my tax background, so I said thank you very much. But LinkedIn 
I also got uh, endorsed, sorry, for accountancy, strategic advice, networking, public speaking, and, so, and all the things I really do. But I stopped giving tax advice in 2006, a long time ago. People kept endorsing me for it, and I was proud. I got hundreds and hundreds of endorsements. Unfortunately, LinkedIn plays a game. This is why I tell you the story. LinkedIn says, oh, Mark Lee has got lots of endorsements for tax. Most other people who have endorsements for tax also have endorsements for inheritance tax and capital gains tax and value-added tax and stamp duty land tax. So would you like to endorse Mark for each of these taxes? And people went, well, I guess Mark wants me to, so yes. So I'm getting endorsements for all sorts of strange taxes that I know nothing about, and I deleted them from my profile because I don't want to confuse people and have endorsements on my profile for things I don't do or that I can't do. I eventually realized the only way to stop that was to take tax off of my... I deleted all the endorsements for tax. Now, nobody gets encouraged to endorse me for anything to do with tax. Fantastic! I would encourage you to do the same. Review your LinkedIn profile. Ensure that the skills that are on there are skills that you have and that you want to promote yourself as having. And don't say yes, don't accept endorsements onto your profile for any skills you don't have. Hardly anybody is going to remember what they ever endorsed you for anyway, unless you've met them personally. There'll be old contacts, old friends, old colleagues who are just doing what LinkedIn is encouraging them to do, even though it's not helping you. You want your endorsements to match the expertise and experience that people read about you on your profile and hear about you when they meet you or when other people talk to you. When you're talking about your expertise and your experience, do you say I'm a lawyer or a divorce lawyer, a conveyancing lawyer, or a property lawyer, or do you wait to find out what the person you are with is most likely to relate to so that you can talk about your expertise and experience in ways that will resonate with them. Comes back to the four suits approach to having more powerful conversations and ensuring that the experience and expertise that you reference is regarding clients who are the person you're with can relate to. Because if you do that, you will stand out from all the other lawyers who don't do that. Explain how clients benefit from your expertise and your experience if you want to rely on your expertise and experience to stand out positively. And that's very different to what most lawyers do, who just rattle off what they or their firm does without any real thought for why the person asked, what do you do? Accountants are just as bad. Financial advisors are just as bad. The best answer I ever had to a question as to what do you do actually came from a financial advisor. Wasn't an accountant, wasn't a lawyer. A financial advisor, she was at one of my networking training events and she stood up and she said, I specialize in helping divorced women over the age of 50 who are worried about their financial future. Now the reason that was so clever was because everybody in the room, as you are doing now, thought, do I know a divorced woman? Are they over 50? And almost by definition, a divorced woman over 50 is either really, really wealthy or worried about their financial future. So this financial advisor was tapping into a particular type of prospective client. What she was also doing, because she added in afterwards, she said, of course, I'm a financial advisor I do all the stuff you'd expect financial advisors to do, but I specialize in helping divorced women over the age of 50 worried about their financial future. Really clever. I have, I've challenged accountants, I've challenged lawyers, I've challenged financial advisors. If you have a line that you think is as powerful and as effective as that, do tell me, because I'd love to, sh to change the story that I keep telling. And I'd love to reference somebody specifically because unfortunately, I don't know the lady's name. So I'd love to tell the story and reference the person in question. But I think you can all relate to that uh, situation. I've already referenced the importance and value of following up effectively. 
two, probably the two most important words that I would highlight today, follow up. Because if you follow up effectively, you will be doing more than most other lawyers are doing. Follow up at least once, but once is not enough. Follow up twice, three times, follow up in different ways. Remember that if you sent an email, the person didn't necessarily receive it. Remember also, most people who receive emails are busy people. They might receive hundreds of, e hundreds of emails. They might have seen it, meant to reply, missed it. Are grateful and appreciate the reminder. Appreciate the phone call, but may not remember that they had an email. Don't you just hate it when somebody rings you up and says, I don't know if you remember, I sent you an email a couple of months ago. What? If I didn't respond, I'm not going to remember an email from two months ago. Are you? So be realistic. Telephone, it is worth picking up the telephone. I've already shown you my, my uh, business card and how I have space for, me, for other people to write down what they want to do by way of follow-up. And that helps me help make clear to them why I'm writing on their card as well. I put the date and time I've met somebody, the location, and what I'm going to do by way of follow-up. Or what came out of the conversation that I want to remember to reflect back when I email them or phone them later. The better you follow up with new prospects and contacts, the more you'll stand out and win more work. Have you ever followed up with somebody before you met them? Sounds like a stupid question, doesn't it? it the wording is probably wrong, but the principle is right. If you're attending various events, be they networking events, seminars, conferences, or whatever, you often get the chance to see the delegate list or the attendee list beforehand. Is there anybody there that you'd particularly like to meet? These days, you can look them up online. You may even be able to find them on LinkedIn and connect with them beforehand, send a personal connection request. See, I notice we're both going to be at LegalX. I'd love to have a quick chat if you've got five minutes. Maybe we can have a coffee. You will stand out because nobody else is doing that. I can count on the fingers of one hand how many lawyers have been in touch with me of my, my, uh, my mailing list or those people who knew I was going to be here today. How many got in touch with me beforehand and said, I'm coming to hear you speak today. I'd love to have a chat with you afterwards. I'm not going to embarrass you because there's only two or three of you here. There's two or three others who hoped to be here who are not in the room today. It's such an easy way to stand out from everybody else. Following up before, starting the follow-up process beforehand, because of course you can then follow up afterwards. I'm sorry I missed you if you didn't see them. But they'll remember you because you got in touch first. Easy ways to stand out and be remembered. And the seventh of our seven-point framework is to having a giving, sharing, and caring mentality. Sorry, the S of hearing <laughs> has got hidden there behind the card. Giving, sharing, and caring mentality. Uh, this is the R picture. I didn't have any cats or dogs or horses to put on there. But it, it makes me go, uh, I think that epitomizes the idea of giving and sharing. The days of being overly protective of your intellectual property are gone. Most information that people want from you in general terms is available freely online. Recognize the difference between what you have to charge for and what you can helpfully share with people without any legal liability, obviously. But having tip sheets or white papers or simple guides, being willing to share a little bit of knowledge and ideas in initial conversations or when you're just chatting people, you will stand out from everybody else, but do think beforehand how far you're going to go. And if you need to add in a phrase, well, that's getting perilously close to billable advice or something equivalent to that, fine, practice what's comfortable in, for you. The one I used to use was, it's getting perilously close to billable advice. People understand it. But you can 
you can't shut the door before you've said anything to evidence your experience, your expertise, your knowledge. So that's giving, sharing, and mentality, a giving, sharing, and caring mentality. I like to operate a giving, sharing, and caring mentality. If you go to my website, forward slash show, you'll find the facility to access the LinkedIn profile tips I mentioned, Twitter tips. I've got a, a blog for professionals who want to stand out from the crowd, all freely available, newsletters and articles as well. No pressure to buy anything from me at all. It's on my website. And if you're really lucky, when you go to the website, the new branding will be live. Uh, and I think that went live yesterday. And that's going to date this video if I show it. So having a genuine giving, sharing, and caring mentality will ensure that you stand out positively for all the other lawyers. So the seven key points of this structure, appearance and attitude on and offline, business branding and messaging, powerful conversational impact, dependability and trust, expertise, education and endorsements, following up effectively, and the giving, sharing, and caring mentality. Those are the seven fundamental principles of a seven-point framework of standout success strategies, which I hope you'll find useful and valuable going forwards. If you want to stand out from the pack, you will win more work and be remembered, referred, and recommended more often than all those lawyers who don't do that. There's a useful summary of all this on my website, on the new website anyway. So if you get there too early, it, it won't be there. A free download highlighting the seven ways in which you can stand out from the pack. I wanted to go back to the first analogy that I drew right at the start. I referenced my background as a member of the Magic Circle. In fact, I'm treasurer of the Magic Circle. And the fact that there is a huge challenge for most lawyers in standing out from everybody else. I'm going to ask a lady at the front to choose one of the cards from this pack in a minute. Whilst she does that, it takes just two minutes. I would like all of you, please, to think of a card in the pack that stands out for you in some way. Okay? Bear with me for a second. I have a bigger pack here for the benefit of those who couldn't see the small ones. I think that, does this mic work? No, I had it turned off. Okay. So now I'm going to struggle, because I should have planned this ahead, to use this mic. There we go. With the large cards. And I suspect, I suspect some of you are thinking of the Ace of Spades. Yeah? There's a card that stands out. When I get to your card, will you stop me, please? Was anybody thinking of the Queen of Hearts? Thinking of the Queen of Hearts? It stands out, doesn't it? Seven of Diamonds? People thinking of Seven of Diamonds. Another card that stands out. Three of Clubs? There's always one or two hands for that. Seven of Sp I do hope your card's not too far down in here. Three of Hearts? Ten of Spades? Three of Hearts? Ten of Spades. Thank goodness for that. Put the rest of these down. Oh, I'll, I'll pick them up in a minute. So you, you chose the, the Ten of Spades from the, the pack just now. I'm pleased that you chose the Ten of Spades because in some ways it does stand out from the rest of the cards. You see, the challenge that lawyers have, not as big a challenge as I've got, trying to use a pack, pack of uh, giant cards and a microphone, but the, the challenge that most lawyers have is that they want to stand out from the pack and they can't rely on magic. That's the Ten of Spades. The card that really does stand out from the pack. Thank you. So I would encourage you to find ways in which you work for you. You don't have to use all of the seven principles. You can use whichever ones you feel comfortable with. The more of them that you use, the more you will stand out from the pack, from the crowd, from your competitors, and from your peers. I hope that was of use, I hope that was of value, and I hope that in future you will go forward and stand out 
from everybody and have a very successful career into the future. Enjoy the rest of your time at LegalX. Thank you for being here this afternoon.